bonjour, euh, donc, euh, je m'appelle Mathias, je fais partie de la radio Inmedias Res. On a été gentiment invité par euh, Slim ici présent qui est en train de mettre des beaux bracelets. Euh, merci Slim de la part de toute l'équipe, vraiment c'est génial. C'est la première fois qu'on s'exporte en dehors de nos bureaux, enfin euh, de notre studio. Euh, bonjour Tim, hi. hi. Euh, donc juste pour les quelques personnes qui ne connaissent pas Tim, je vais faire un rapide, euh, rapide état des lieux. Donc Tim, il est, euh, il est professeur d'études culturelles à l'université de East London depuis 20 ans. Et il est l'auteur de, de trois livres qui relatent... Euh, l'histoire de la dance music aux états unis particulièrement à New York. On a deux exemplaires euh, ici même. Le, le premier, c'est euh, Life and Death on the New York Dance Floor, qui s'intéresse à la période 80-83. Et le deuxième est une euh, anti-biography sur euh, euh, Arthur Russell. Euh, le, le troisième livre, euh, qui s'appelle Love Saves the Day, A History of American Dance Music, c'est son premier livre, il est sorti il y a, en 2004. Et euh, c'est sur celui-là qu'on va plus s'attarder aujourd'hui. Euh, Tim, il est cofondateur du Lucky Cloud Sound System, qui organise des soirées Loft à, à Londres depuis 2003. Et euh, les soirées All Our Friends, qui sont euh, des soirées sur invitation, donc sur modèle euh, de, de, du Loft, et, et qui, ont, euh, euh, bah, qui existent depuis 2-3 euh, ans, je crois, maintenant. Euh, donc voilà, on va parler pendant une heure et demie de, bah, de son histoire, déjà et de celle de David Mancuso, donc qui est DJ et, et l'hôte musical des soirées privées du Loft à New York, euh, voilà, qui ont marqué la culture club de New York et, et qui est un peu à l'origine de, de, de la naissance du disco, euh, pas qu'un peu d'ailleurs. Euh, voilà, maintenant, euh, moi je vais essayer de moins parler, on va, on va laisser Tim nous raconter un peu l'histoire. Euh, le talk va être en anglais, donc euh, j'espère que tout le monde... Euh, comprend l'anglais. Si vous, si vous avez des questions, vous avez besoin de précision, n'hésitez pas à nous dire. Um, so, we can begin. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here with us today. That's a real pleasure. Thank you um, for the invite. Yeah, I, I'd like to start a bit with, with maybe with your own experience. Uh, first of all, maybe uh, you as, a, as an individual, as a writer, entering a scene, a music scene and, and becoming a, a pro kind of promoter later uh, I know what what guided you through through the through the whole process of uh, first telling stories about music and then uh, organizing parties <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, uh well first of all thank you for the invite it's a real pleasure to be in Paris um I came a few months ago to listen to Slim's homemade clip shorts uh and I love the sound of them and I love the organic feel of, of what's happening in Paris and uh, the fact that we have another community party. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, it's really nice to be back. Um, this, I'm, 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 no, I'm not young anymore. So this question is a question about half of my life. Um, so, but I'll try to not, not talk too long about that. Um, When I was at university, um, this was in the, the second half of the 1980s. Uh, I was at university 80, 1986 to 1989. Uh, 1988, uh, I stayed to work uh, that summer uh, in Manchester, where I was studying. And this was the summer of love. Uh, and I went to the Hacienda one night uh, before my job started. And I walked into the middle of this uh, incredible dance scene that was beginning to take off uh, in the United Kingdom. And really, it was house music plus ecstasy, MDMA. Uh, at the time, I knew nothing about house music and I knew nothing about MDMA, nothing about ecstasy. I walked into the door with my friends and I had never seen a scene like it. Um, There was maybe a thousand people in there and it was a, an ecstatic dance party. Everyone was had their arms in the air. Uh, people were wearing beach wear as if they were going to the beach. Uh, everyone had whistles uh, and there were, there were lots of podiums and people were dancing on the podiums. And it took me 
about 10 seconds from entering that room to going on top of one of the podiums and just throwing myself into the culture. It was, it was instantaneous, the affinity I felt. Uh, it was communal, it was democratic, uh, participatory, and the music was incredible to me at that particular point. I'd never heard house music before. Uh, I'd never heard a DJ before. I'd never heard a big sound system before. Uh, and I felt at home. I felt like a connection. Um, and, um, and so that was the beginning of it for me. Um, maybe about four years later. Um, well, no, sorry. I'm get, I don't want to get this chronology mixed up. Um, but by then, uh, my dad had died um, two years earlier. Uh, and then my mum died two years later. And it was a very difficult time for me. Um, and around about that point, another friend, I'd moved back to London and a friend said, uh, encouraged me to come into, uh, to go dancing into what was then the rave scene. Um, and to me, the rave scene was very exciting. Uh, it was in warehouses uh, with lots of kind of techno music, um, but it lacked the intimacy that I, that I really kind of wanted. Um, and so um, I then started to gravitate to this, this, uh, this party called um, uh, Feel Real at the Gardening Club. Uh, which was a Friday night party, and it was in a basement in the Covent Gar in Covent Garden. The uh, the new Apple Store is now taken over that location um, as part of the corporatization of London. Um, and this was a very intimate party, and it had a very uh, New York feel to it. Um, I only found that out as I was going along. I befriended the main DJ. Um, it was a collective, but the main DJ was uh, called the Rhythm Doctor, a guy called Chris. Um, and he would, I started to give him money to buy records. You know, he was like, if you buy this record for yourself, buy that record for me. I, was div I had become a, a devotee of this guy. Um, and, and it was there really that, um, I would say, um, by the kind of the, this affinity I had for the culture really took root. Um, at that time I felt like, uh, the dance floor was kind of saving my life. Um, that without the dance floor and the feeling it gave me, uh, the sense of hope, the sense of community, um, that. I don't know what I would have done. I was would have gone to maybe a very dark place. Um, it was the most important thing to me in my life, other than my surviving family. Um, so in a way, that was the real beginning for me. Um, and it was very soon into going to that club that a DJ uh, called Louis Vega, one half of Masters at Work, uh, guested, was a guest DJ uh, for one party. And I remember that the Louis set very clearly. I remember the records he played. I remember crying on the dance floor. Um, and very soon afterwards, I decided I wanted to go to live in New York City um, to be closer to the music that I loved because almost all of the music that I really was, was attracted to uh, was coming out of New York City. This was around 91, 92. Um, it was a very uh, prolific, creative time in the New York dance scene. Um, at that time, for me, it's changed now. But at that time, it seemed as though house music contained everything anyone could want from music. Um, it, it was electronic. It was propulsive. It was dynamic. It was good for mixing. Uh, but the music that was coming out of New York had elements of dub, had elements of soul, had elements of funk, had elements of Latin music, had elements of African music. And it sounded as if the whole world, the whole of a kind of cosmopolitan community was contained within that music. And to me, that was a very beautiful thing. Um, so I wanted to be closer to that music. And so I decided to go and live in New York. Uh, I'd also been working as a journalist at the time. I became disillusioned with working as a journalist. I became a bit disillusioned with what we could call mainstream politics. The conservatives were in power in the United Kingdom. It seemed that they would never get out of power. So I decided to become more focused on cult what I would say you could call cultural politics. Um, so I went to do a doctorate in English literature at, at, uh, at Columbia University uh, in New York in order to study with a guy there called Edward Said, a professor who was really interesting to me, but also to be closer to this music community. Um, I loved that music community that I 
managed to become part of in New York. Uh, first, I was going to the Sound Factory Bar where Louis Vega was playing every uh, Wednesday night. After a couple of years, the big party in town was called Body and Soul, where Francois Kevorkian, Danny Crivet, and Joe Closel uh, were DJing. But it was around about 1997, uh, early 1997, um, that some some people started to think that house music had been around for at least 10 years and it was becoming a bit repetitive. It was running out of ideas, that there were too many house tracks um, that were designed or created um, in order for a DJ to be able to mix the record rather than making a record that in and of itself was a really engaging, rich uh, piece of piece of culture, a piece of music. Um, so, and there was also this emergence at the time of the cult of the DJ, um, where the DJ seemed to be the most Im important thing. And it was there was a lot of worshipping of the DJ. The, so this was, and these were elements of the culture that I was beginning to find a little bit tiring uh, or less engaging to me. And it was at precisely this moment that I was becoming beginning to drift from the the culture a little bit or was becoming to or was beginning to ask questions of the culture um, that I met David Mancuso. Um, so I had already taken an interest in this um, from a writing point of view at Columbia University. Um, early into the studies I was doing English English literature uh, but there a professor uh, suggested to me that I write a quick book about house music. Um, this was partly because um, in the United Kingdom in 1994, um, the John Major government, a conservative government, passed the Criminal Justice Act, uh, which attempted to criminalise rave culture along with various other things such as uh, hunt saboteurs, roads protesters, etc., etc. Um, so a professor at Columbia said, write a quick book about house music. Um, and I thought that I would do this in addition to my other studies. Um, and I started to do some initial research. And I was going uh, record shopping at a place called, a record store called Dance Tracks, uh, every Friday night. Um, and the co uh, the Dance Tracks was run by Joe Closel, uh, who's now a very famous producer and DJ, of course, and another guy called Stefan Prescott. And Stefan had suggested to me, if you're going to write a book about house music, you should probably speak to David Mancuso. He was there somewhere around the beginning. Um, I spoke to some other people about David, and most people said, don't bother interviewing David. He's not relevant. Um, he has a nice sound system, but, it's, but no one is interested in his sound system because it's a it's a stereo system and it doesn't have power uh, and it doesn't doesn't you know it doesn't have bass uh, and his parties aren't really running anymore uh, he's very esoteric but he doesn't even he's not really a DJ he doesn't even mix he's not relevant to this history um, I'd contacted David um, anyway and uh, he had agreed to do the interview and so I decided to go ahead with the interview and during that interview. My my life changed uh, during you know that that evening that afternoon. When, when there the was so this was uh, I think it was the autumn of 1997. Um, <clears throat> so um, Dave, I, it was a three hour interview with David, and uh, I understood almost nothing that David said. Um, during the course of that interview. And that's partly because David speaks in a very tangential, uh, philosophical, um, imaginative way. Um, and he, his thoughts weren't necessarily particularly organized. Uh, so that was part of one reason. Um, but the other reason was that David was talking about a history that I knew nothing about. Uh, and I had read also every book that existed on dance music culture at that particular time. And none of these books spoke about The Loft, really. Do you, um, know, do you know why? Well, because David was, he was underground and he was always um, something other than disco. Um, so books that had started to come out would refer to disco and then they would, would refer usually to Frankie Knuckles and the Warehouse in Chicago where mythologically house music is derived from. Uh, was born. 
uh, and they would talk about the Paradise Garage and Larry Levan, which became the biggest, best known uh, private party in New York City, uh, where there would be thousands of people uh, going every week. Um, and these were much, these were more outward looking venues uh, and they attracted more people. Whereas David and the Loft had always been a very intimate house party. And David had always avoided all forms of publicity. Um, and then he had also fallen on hard times. Uh, in 1984, he, he made a move from, a, from one venue to another venue and uh, he lost his crowd uh, very quickly. So it was a, it had become, his, his life had become a struggle from 1984 through to the point when I met him, 1997. Uh, he was down and out. Um, he, was, he wasn't doing very well, I don't think, as a, on, in a, as a human being. He, was, he didn't have any money. Um, he didn't look well. His party was barely functioning, um, and yet I met him, and it was one of the most. He was one of the most engaging people I had ever met. I mean, he's he's charismatic. He was full of ideas. He was passionate, and he he spoke in a way that personally I related to. Um, he was. I mean, I don't want to reduce what he was saying to politics, but everything he thought about, he thought about in a political way. Um, I, I suppose one way I would put this is to say he was a child of the countercultural uh, revolution or the countercultural movement. Uh, he came out of the late 60s, uh, or that was the formative moment where there was experimentation with LSD. Uh, there was the civil rights movement was still you know, in full flow, although uh, suffering some setbacks but was very much on the agenda. Uh, the feminist movement was gaining momentum. The gay liberation movement was gaining momentum. The anti-war movement was, you know, very strong. And these were David's reference po reference points. And he took these reference points and he, he transferred them into the way that he wanted to put on a party. And everything that David would do from the beginning when he put on these parties, he would think through in terms of an ethical, an ethical point of view. Um, and this came through in his conversation. So I was very drawn to this, that for him, the party was a, a space of community that could make the world a better place. And I had come from the United Kingdom, hoping to make the world a better place through political journalism, I had become disillusioned with that because the Conservatives were always in power and nothing any journalist would do, could do would seem to change that. And so I was interested in culture. And David was asking questions about culture, in, in particular in dance music, that other people weren't really asking. Uh, he, for example, didn't want to play in a club because he thought that the price of the drinks was exploitative and that you shouldn't be charging people if they want to drink alcohol. You shouldn't be making profit out of that. David didn't want to play, let's say, a bootleg of a record because that would mean that the artist might not have been paid. Um, David even started to think that, I mean, these are, you could, people could just, I sometimes didn't agree with David, by the way. What I'm trying to say is that just the way he was thinking uh, was really interesting to me. Uh, and appealed. Yeah, he wouldn't. Uh, he got to the point where he didn't want to mix two records together because that he thought that that was him uh, interfering with the artistic intent of the original artist. And who was he? You know, a mere party host. Uh, who was he to change the recording of a record by by introducing a mix? I mean, at the time, I was still pretty interested in mixing, so I, I might have had my arguments with David. But just the fact he was thinking about these things, I found fascinating. But the main, th aside from finding being drawn to him, uh, if you like, philosophically and also socially, was that David told me this in this three hour interview, he started to map out a story in which he said, don't begin your book on house music in 1984 in Chicago and New York. You need to begin your story in 1970 uh, in, in New York City, which is when he started his parties. Um, and he, would, he spoke about the, you know, all of these DJs who were part of this very early, and it, this is a pre-disco scene. Disco didn't acquire its name until 1974. So for almost five years, David and the whole of the New York scene was developing without any of these names being attached to it. There was no disco, there was no rap music, there was no hip hop, uh, and there was no punk. 
there were all these communities were taking form, but they were, you know, this in a way is the argument of the last book. They were actually sharing culture and developing culture in a similar way without the name tags that then would go on to later separate them. Um, so, so I, I did. So I didn't know what David was talking about. Is the point? He would say, you know, he would talk about Michael Capello and Steve DeQuisto and Nicky Ciano and the New York City Record Pool and Bobby Guttadaro and the Sanctuary and the Limelight and all of these reference points. And I was sitting there as someone who thought I knew a lot about this culture and I didn't know any of this. So I'd come from journalism and I I knew a story when I ran into one. And this was a story. It was a story of a radical social and musical culture that had taken root in downtown New York from early 1970 onwards and that no one had really written about and uh, and that this was a uh, very open-ended very innovative culture and that really DJ culture this culture that we've all become interested in really um, started to unfold at that particular moment so I was I was really captivated and um, I mean by this point just to kind of finish off, the, I guess, this bit of the story. Um, I had already set up interviews with um, Frankie Knuckles, Tony Humphreys and David Morales because I thought I was writing a book about house music. Um, so I carried on with these interviews uh, and each time, on with all of these interviews, I asked Frankie and Tony and David, by the way, have you heard of this guy called David Mancuso and The Loft? Because uh, I met him and he sounds really interesting, but no one's really written about him and I don't quite know how to understand if what he's telling me um, is is genuine, is accurate, you know, because you can meet people and they can exaggerate their own importance or they can imagine certain things. Um, and each, Frankie and Tony and David, they all replied in almost exactly the same way. Ah, David Mancuso in the loft. The loft was the most important place for me as I was entering into dance culture and learning about the potentiality of the dance floor, the way in which we can kind of um, create a better world on the dance floor. Uh, in ways that is unparalleled in the outside world. It was also David who taught me about the panoramic scope of music and the, the way that you can introduce this v vast range of sounds onto the dance floor and make them introduce these sounds and combine them in a way that will work and will, that will take people on the journey. So once I heard these three, you know, these legendary DJs all say the same thing about David. I was like, okay, this is this is something I need to really write about. Um, and initially, the idea was, okay, I'll write one chapter about David Mancuso and disco in the 1970s, uh, and then the rest of the book will be the book about house music. Um, but the that story of of David and the 1970s and the rise of disco and you could kind of say the fall of disco, but then the way that David and this this downtown uh, private party scene um, had taken was was had taken such deep root that it survived the backlash against disco. And to me, that that story was so compelling that became Love Saves the Day, the first book, and that was a a 500 page book. Um, and just because you asked it, so then when that book was going into production, uh, David turned to me and to a friend of his from New York City called Colleen Murphy, uh, who had uh, worked as a musical host at The Loft uh, to support David on uh, some occasions. Um, he turned to Colleen and myself and he said, would you like to put on parties in London? So this, and indeed my reply to David was to say, but David, um, I'm, I'm now an author, I work in a university, I'm not a party promoter. And David rep David's reply was to say, exactly. Uh, he, he wanted to work with me because he considered us to be, have become friends because I'd done lots of interviews with him at that point. Uh, he didn't want to work with a party promoter. He didn't want to work with industry. He didn't want to work with anything that he thought was commercial. And it's not because he thought that the industry or the commercial side of dance music culture were necessarily bad. It just wasn't what David wanted to do. He was interested in community and forming friendships. And with that community and those friends, uh, finding a place to party where you can explore uh, 
a different form of transcendence. And you can go in places that is not possible in the outside world by combining beautiful sound equipment, beautiful music, and a comfortable environment where people feel free and can express themselves. And David's thing was, if you don't interfere with people, beautiful things will start to happen. And he didn't really think that if you started to try to commercialize something, that that would be so easy to feel how hold on to that feeling. So the very fact I said I'm not a party promoter was, you know, that was Dave. That was David's way in. Really, he he wanted to form a new community. So we put on a party in London uh, in June 2003. Was the first party. The party was later later became known as Lucky Cloud Sound System. Um, but initially, we didn't really have a name. The name wasn't important. When David started The Loft, it didn't have a name. It was a house party. Um, so that was how I started to get involved with um, helping uh, organize the parties. And Pauline is here and some other folks are here. You know, the, the London, London became a real community. Uh, and that was, that was, I think this is why the, this is why the, you know, uh, I mean, we've lost, there's a lot of history to fill in between here. But the loft next February uh, is going to be 50 years old. And it's still running, even though David passed away, I think, two and a half years ago. I'm losing track of time. David had started a party in Japan. Uh, this was in around about 1999. That party is still, London, uh, still running. Uh, David, with, with the little group of us in London, we started this party in London in 2003. That party is still running. And I'm completely convinced that the reason for this is because there is a community that underpins these parties. And when you have a community, people will support each other and it will be the roots of it are really strong. Um, and that's what David was about. And so when David died um, in, I think, November 2016, um, and there were obituaries were being published and people were saying, oh, the godfather of electronica has died, etc." And I, because I write about, I've written a lot about David and I, you know, I, I care about his legacy. I wrote some obituaries myself and I was like, no, 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 no. David was not the godfather of electronica. This is not what he was about. He was, he was, a, he was a person who was devoted to the idea of putting on a party uh, for friends um, that would be a warm and comfortable environment. That's it. Uh, in in some respects, everything else is detail. Was it the the, the this thing was was it uh, already uh, applicable at the beginning of the loft? All this philosophy about the party, or, or did he, did it go? Did he go through a process during the years, or what was it in, at the beginning? I um, think um, it's a good question. Um, certainly, there were developments. So the sound system developed. But at that very first party, uh, David had Clipshawn speakers. We got a couple of the original ones at the back there. Uh, and the Clipshawns never changed. So at one point, definitely in the second half of the 1970s, David moved to a, a sec his second venue on Prince Street. It was a larger space. Uh, and David was making a lot of money at that point. He was charging $12.99 for entry. Maybe 1,200 people would be going along. Um, so that's quite a lot. And it's weekly, every Saturday night. That's, uh, you know, it's, it's, a lot of, it's quite a lot of money. And, but David wasn't interested in money. He didn't care about material possessions other than sound equipment. <laughs> uh, and so with that money, he spent huge amounts of money on his sound system. And so he would start to do things at that point, such as he would buy uh, cartridges from Japan, which are called Koetsu cartridges. Um, they are made by hand by a person who also makes swords by hand, makes Japanese swords for martial arts fighting. This person also made Koetsu cartridges. They yeah. are objects of... Uh, do you want to...? Yeah, cartridges is uh, oh. c uh, des diamants pour les platines, pour ceux qui sont pas au courant. So David was spending, he was buying the very best amplifier in the world, which was designed by a musician, a cellist, who also happened to um, connect with uh, Arthur Russell. Um, um, uh, a, a person called Mark Levinson, who was making the best amplifiers in the world. And David was buying record number. Most people would buy one of these amplifiers for their home. And David may have bought 12 of these amplifiers. 
Um, he was spending a lot of money on sound. And when he wasn't spending money on sound, he was spending money on taking his friends to a restaurant to eat food together and to share, uh, spending time together. Um, so yeah, so, so the sound system developed, but at the very beginning, the principle was that it's a stereo sound uh, and that it's a warm musical sound. David had been, the first time David heard clipshorns, he was blown away by the sound of the clipshorns. So David in the late, he, so it's in, I think it's significant to say, David was born in, a, uh, he was, he was, um, he moved to a children's home at a very, very young age. Uh, he was just a few days old when he was taken to uh, the children's home. Um, and so he grew up in a children's home. He didn't grow up with his parents. Uh, and a, a woman called Sister Alicia, the nun who was looking after him in the children's home, became a very important figure for David. Every Saturday night, or as often as possible, David says, she would put on a party for the children who were living in the home as a way to just help them have a good time and relax. All of these kids had come from very difficult backgrounds. You know, they were in that home because they couldn't, they didn't come from a stable family. And so what they became used to was a different idea of a family, a family where you may not be tied by blood, but you are tied by affinity, by feeling. And the family might move. It might not be very stable, but it's still very important to you. And it's a family that is defined not by being the same, but, buying diff but by being different. People from all different backgrounds make up that family. Um, so that's, that was formative for David. And in many ways, I think that's what the loft ended up becoming. Yes, because the people who would go to the loft, these were David's friends, but David's friend was friends with a very diverse group of people. And one significant component of that group of people were black gay men. Uh, they were double, double, doubly marginalized by being both gay and by being black. Um, David at the time was dating um, a guy called Larry Patterson, who was a gay black man. And so this was a significant part of the, was, of the loft was the idea that um, people who don't necessarily have a, a regular place in society where they are seen as full human citizens could go to the loft and could enjoy full acceptance and a sense of being part of a community and a, and to express themselves as they wanted to. So in a way, the loft became a, like the children's home. Yeah, people who in the outside world were outcasts could go into the loft and could be, could be equal and could be free and could express themselves. So this was formative for David. Um, but then in the, he moved from upstate New York, where this the children's home was uh, in Utica, uh, to... Um, Manhattan in the mid 1960s. Quite early on into living in New York, he then uh, bought a loft in down. A, no, he didn't buy a loft. He bought the key to a loft in downtown New York. These were. This was uh, this period where the U.S. the American economy was transitioning from uh, an industrial economy to a post-industrial economy. Uh, the industrial economy was going into decline. There was competition in, in the East from Japan and the rising tiger economies that meant that America, US factories, American factories and industry was beginning to close down. This resulted in downtown New York, the, manufa the industrial sec uh, district being partly or largely abandoned. There were lots of empty industrial buildings and a whole movement of artists and musicians started to move into these spaces during the, in particular, the latter part of the 1960s and the early 1970s. And David became part of this movement, living in these abandoned loft spaces. So he arrived with, this, with these ideas. Number one, having been formed by the children's home. Uh, number two, he was moving into downtown New York in this new experimental ways of living. It was illegal to live in, in these loft spaces. Um, so, and if, a, if the government inspected the loft spaces, they could, they could throw you out if you were living there illegally for residential purposes rather than work purposes. So the people who lived in these lofts, they would hide the kitchen and they would hide the bedroom. 
But then they were also happy to have a very a non-existent bedroom and a tiny, tiny kitchen because they weren't interested in sleeping and in cooking. They wanted to reinvent their lives in a creative way and they wanted to get away from the domesticity and what they might call the banality of post-war American culture, suburban culture, where the dad, the, the dad would go to work at nine o'clock and return at five o'clock, and the mum would be at home and she would be preparing a cocktail for when he returns. And during the day, she would, you know, iron the sheets and do the laundry and look after the home. This was this was dominant culture in post-war America, and David's generation, and there were. Th- thousands upon thousands of other people who shared this attitude with him they wanted a break with that and they wanted to reinvent what it meant to be a human being they wanted to seek liberation um so david was part of this movement you lived in a loft you didn't have a kitchen you didn't have a bedroom it didn't matter you would use your space flexibly in other ways it would be more communal more creative um so this was important and the other thing is that david got involved with timothy leary Um, or he became acquainted with Timothy Leary. He started to take acid. As David told me when we were doing these interviews, it was still legal to take acid when he started to take acid. But this was had a formative uh, impact on him. Um, Timothy Leary, he was the found... Uh, he was a, uh, the Harvard yeah. academic who became one of the key, pro- a very controversial proponent of, of acid culture. I mean, there were many other people. Some people ended up blaming Timothy Leary for being um, too careless with the way that he attempted to spread acid culture. Um, but other people would say that it was necessary to, to do what Leary did to have the backlash in order to then find ways to start um, exploring the potentiality of this drug in a more calm and constructive way. But irrespective of anyone's view of Timothy Leary, um, David was spending time with Leary. He would go to Timothy Leary's acid parties. He took acid. And anyone who in the room has taken acid or have read about it will understand that acid opens up these doors of perception and experience. It um, allows you into a realm of connectivity where things that seem to be disconnected suddenly seem to be connected. It introduces the idea that uh, our everyday perceptions are, are limited and that Actually, when we go beyond these perceptions, we understand dimensionalities, even other universes, other ways of being that we previously hadn't understood. Um, when we listen to music or we, we, we look at things when, when we're on acid, uh, we develop a more open, more engaging and more vital experience of what these things are. And the idea that they are separate from us begins to collapse because we become part of them and they become part of us. So this was very important for David. But when when he went to Timothy Leary's acid parties, generally speaking, if there was music playing, it would be music that you would trip out to, lying down on a sofa. And David's idea was, okay, so I've got a downtown loft Um, I've got a very diverse group of friends, much more diverse, I suspect, than would be going to Timothy Leary's parties. Um, I'm interested in acid culture. I've just bought myself some Clipshorn loudspeakers. And he was also beginning to put on similar parties where people would, he would have a reel-to-reel tape and he'd make an eight-hour kind of trip tape um, that people would listen to. But then David had the idea, what happens if we try and actually move our bodies during this experience? What happens if we play dance dance music, R&B music, uh, jazz music, African music? Um, so he decided to put on a, dan- a dance party with all of these other things. I mean, one more thing I should probably mention, which goes into making the loft this kind of this original phenomenon, is that David David was really into what's called the rent party scene. Uh, the rent party scene dates back to 1920s Harlem. Um, it followed the migrate the great migration north of African Americans who had been living in the rural South, and then wanted to move north to cities such as Chicago and then New York City in search of work, as the United States was uh, industrializing and work was to be found in cities. Uh, Harlem took root during this period as a a place of African-American center and a community. 
And then people who are living in African Americans who are living in Harlem during this period, uh, when they couldn't afford to pay the rent, they would put on what's called a rent party. And at the rent party, you would just welcome people into your home. You would ask them to make a donation at the door. You couldn't afford to officially charge people because that would be illegal. But you can ask them to make a donation to donate some money. And inside, there'd be some food. And in the corner of the room, there'd be a turntable and the host might put on records. And this was David's favorite way of socializing. Um, the discotheque scene had already taken root in New York City from the early 1960s onwards. But the discotheque scene didn't interest David. Uh, it was couples only, straight couples only. Um, the DJing wasn't really what we think of DJing because the role of the DJ was to uh, make money for the bar. That was what they were employed to do. So the DJ would do, I interviewed some of these guys, the DJ would do this by um, building up the crowd into a frenzy across maybe three or four or five records. And then they would kill what they called kill the dance floor by putting on a slow record. So they would build up a frenzy and then they'd put on a slow record. And at that point, everyone who was dancing would go to the bar, buy a drink, and a guy might invite a woman to dance. There were no, I mean, there would have been gay men and lesbian women in this situation, but they, men were not allowed to dance with men. And it was unthinkable that a woman should dance with a woman. This was a straight environment. So Dave, and it was, David wasn't interested in this. It was kind of, it was, um, discotheque culture was kind of, was in some ways more liberated than other forms of social dance that had come previously. Um, but it wasn't as liberated as what was going on in the countercultural movement with gay liberation and, and, and the anti-war movement and the feminist movement. David wants, was radical. Um, and so he was more comfortable in the rent party scene. He also liked the rent party scene because it was in someone's home. And if you were in someone's home, like we are here, it's, it, you can relax, it's comfortable, it's an, it, like we have in this room, it's an intimate space. When, when David came to London and we were, I was looking for venues um, and David was giving guidelines, his thing was to say, if we can't have it in someone's home, then we need it in somewhere that is home-like. And the measure for that is, if you had to spend the night in that, in that venue, would you feel comfortable? Yeah. yeah. Do you, is the manager, are the management nice? You know, do they smile at you when you walk in through the door? Um, does, it, does it seem like a warm environment? So David liked the rent party scene because it was intimate. And he said, in these spaces, uh, you can get to know people and you can go deeper. Yeah, you can, you, the party can go further. So this was the other key element that went into David's first party. He, had, he was beginning to get the sound system. He had the downtown loft space, which was really interesting. He was exploring LSD. Um, he wanted to have music as well as to, to dance, that you could dance to that would go with the LSD experience. But he also wanted the rent party scene. That in a way was the most important thing for David, the intimate space where friends can relax. So this is how it started. He threw a party on, on Valentine's Day 1970, which was a Saturday night, 14th of February. Um, and he sent out an invitation to friends and friends of friends. And the invitation had a Salvador Dali picture on the front cover that he must have photocopied. Uh, it was the one of the melting clocks, which itself is significant. Uh, it's about the idea that you are entering into a space where our usual routines, our everyday lives are going to go to one side. And we're going to go into a different experience of time and space and sociality, how we relate to each other. Um, so there was Salvador Dali's clock, uh, melting clocks was on the front, and then there was the words, love saves the day. So love saves the day was a reference to Valentine's Day. In this case, it wasn't about um, a narrow idea of heterosexual love that leads to marriage and children and all of these things. There's nothing wrong with that per se, but David wanted more with this party. Um, so, um, so love saves the day was about universal love. Um, which was coming out of the late 1960s. The idea that we could transform the world in, and, and turn it into a, a place of, 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 of where people 
love each other rather than they're at war with each other. There was an awful lot of war going on at the point. So Love Saves the Day, um, it was about universal love, but it was, of course, also a reference point to Love save to LSD. Love, L, saves, S, the day, D, LSD. So it was an acid party. Um, so this was a transformative experience. Uh, it didn't have a name. It was just a party that David put on in his loft, just like any of us might have a birthday party or party in our homes and we invite our friends and we have a nice dance. I mean, in some ways, that's all it was. Um, but it was, a, it was the combination of all of these elements of the sound system, of the unusual downtown space, a very mixed crowd uh, and the acid and the fact that because it was in David's home and it wasn't in a in a public discotheque, it meant that David didn't have to stop at 3.30 in the morning. That was the licensing, uh, the licensing regulations meant that discotheques had to close at 3.30 in the morning. But David was about transformative, explorative experiences. So he wanted the party to run its natural course. Uh, and this soon became, a, this was a 12 hour party really, because that's the length of an acid trip. Um, so this is, the beginning, this is the beginning of a new form of experience of, of music, really. Um, David wasn't really a technical DJ, but he put on records that night and he selected them according to the energy of the crowd. And the energy started, as an acid trip does, with a sense of the worlds and your perceptions beginning to shift. Um, you're entering tentatively into a new environment. And then gradually you enter into this very deep and transcendental and intense phase. And then towards the end of the experience, you reconnect more with, with people around you. And you, end in a, you have a sense of joy and connectivity. And in a sense, I mean, this is a... Uh, a crude way of putting it, but this is in a way the beginning of the DJ set. The idea that this experience is like a journey and that journey is a musical journey that takes people with them. And that what's going on in this situation isn't just the DJ putting on records to manipulate a crowd to make them go and buy drinks. This is the DJ, and David wouldn't even call himself a DJ by the way, but this is the DJ entering into a conversation with the dancers. And David said people would come up during the course of that party and they would request a record, ask him if he'd play a record. And that record would already be on the turntable and it would be the next record that David was going to play. Yeah, there was a sense of synchronicity, of a telepathic understanding. Uh, David called it the third ear instead of the third eye, the all hearing ear. Uh, this was something happened which, which defied regular understandings of consciousness uh, and of music. So this is the beginning. Now, I'm going to say one more very quick. Simultaneous to this, discotheque culture was also radicalized prob almost the same weekend, within a few weeks. It's been impossible to tell. A guy called Francis Grasso was at the Sanctuary. The Sanctuary was a boring discotheque, but then two gay entrepreneurs called Seymour and Shelley uh, took over that discotheque very shortly after New Year's Eve, 1969 going into 1970. And Seymour and Shelley were the first two discotheque owners to welcome a gay crowd into a discotheque. Up until that point, it had been illegal. It still was, sorry, illegal for men to dance with each other. But Seymour and Shelley paid off the, you know, they paid off the police and they had, they opened their door to the gay crowd. And Francis Grasso, uh, around the same time that David was beginning to do this uh, explorative journeys with music, um, Francis was doing something similar because when the gay crowd came into the sanctuary, the energy was transformed and Francis also responded to the energy of that crowd. Um, and Francis was the DJ who inspired um, beat mixing or in innovated beat mixing. And he did this because um, he thought that he wanted to find ways to um, sustain and to um, complement the energy of the crowd. He said the energy of the crowd was so intense that he didn't want there to be a gap between the records. So he invented kind of very rudimentary form of beat mixing. So this was, so discotheque culture and DJ culture was around the beginning of 1970 was also going through its own transformation. Um, so I'm mentioning this because I don't think we should credit everything to David, but what was interesting, and this is just this um, it's symbolic, is that within 
maybe I forget the exact date, but within a year, the sanctuary was closed. Um, and within two or three years, Francis Grasso's career was m almost over. And this, uh, but David carried on, you know, through, and he carried on with this vision of what the party should be about. And he didn't compromise that vision hardly ever in in all of the years that he was putting on on loft parties i mean for so for 47 years or something that he was putting on loft parties and it it goes back to this thing that i said at the beginning it was this what david really did in a way was he created a community situation uh where music uh and dancing could be explored in a safe environment on a weekly basis uh and it was in that situation that people experienced a f the, the transfer a greater sense of transformation than in any other setting and this was in a way the the, the enduring g legacy if you like of the loft was the idea of creating these um, intimate spaces that are not open to the public um, that, and because of that are able to endure and sustain themselves. Whereas discotheque culture, club culture, it tends to be much more transient. Um, you know, they open one week and they close the next. Crowds go to one club one week and then they go, the next week they go to another club. So it was this idea of creating a really intimate space that, and I think that meant that the music, the sound system, the experience went deeper with David. Um, um, uh, oh, we have a few minutes left, mm. fortunately. But Are you serious? <laughs> No, that's that's slim, slim rules, you know. Uh, but I'd like to to have a little bit of focus on the yeah. music, yeah. like art artistically. Um, you, what you said about the feeling of the music and the impact on the dancers. Obviously, the music evolved during the years, mm. during these forty years. But how uh, did he kept uh, this feeling, uh, even if music was changing with electronic music coming in? Uh, with less, uh, obviously, rock music, less psychedelic music. How would did, did it evolve uh, artistically for, for David Mancuso as a DJ? Hmm. Um, <sighs> David was always... Um, he would always listen to contemporary music. Um, so... And he would always listen to as much music as he could. I think the thing with music with David maybe is to um, is to think that the music was also a form of of exploration and openness. Um, so one of the things that struck me when I first went to the loft um, was just how different the music was to what I was hearing at Body and Soul. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed the music at Body and Soul a great deal, but it was mainly house music and there was a, a bit of disco was thrown in. Um, and then when I went to the loft, I felt like the the horizons, the scope, the, the view broadened exponentially it was much broader david would play almost anything that you know that because because the journey involved almost an entire life you know you almost go the experience of going to a, to a loft party was almost as if you were um experiencing an entire life in music because you would start um with, with a certain level of of, of of calmness, of intimacy, of simplicity. Um, and then through the course of that party, which would often last 12 hours, sometimes longer, you would go on a journey. And And David was interested in connecting. So uh, early on, he was playing soul music and he was playing R&B music and he was playing... Um, but he would play rock music if it was danceable. Um, he was playing African imports and was the first uh, DJ to start, uh, well, not a DJ, sorry, the first person to start uh, breaking records like Manu Dibango, Sol Makosa. Other, other DJs weren't playing this this kind of music. He was playing Latin music. When disco came along, of course, he would, he would play disco music, but he was always mixing disco music with other kinds of music. And indeed, when there was the backlash against disco, one of the things that David said is that if the people who had been playing disco had been mixing it with other kinds of music, maybe there wouldn't have been such a backlash against disco. It was because disco, um, by the late 1960s, um, 
became um, a singularity. It became the o- it became um, it became the only sound that people were hearing. That they became sick of it. And David's philosophy was always to combine different elements. He wanted his dancers to come from all different backgrounds, and similarly, he wanted the music to come from a, the widest uh, range of sources. Um, when there was the backlash against disco, a lot of people assumed that the um, that this would seriously impact upon parties like the Loft, because all of a sudden the major record companies uh, and a lot of independents pulled back from making music for dancing. But David wasn't didn't really mind too much because David wasn't interested in formulaic music, and by the end of disco, disco had become formulaic. Um, but the Loft had started before disco. Um, it had been running for five years, pretty much, before disco broke through. So, in a sense, it was quite easy for David to survive the backlash against disco because he had never been about just one particular sound. And the early 1980s was a very diverse period for music where elements of disco and elements of punk and elements of even hip hop and rap started to combine uh, R&B came back in a big way as well a kind of uh, more earthy form of soul music um, so this was also a kind of key moment for David when house music came through David wasn't always that keen on house music um, he felt sometimes that it could be uh, too rigid and too formulaic and he became very crit- he was very critical of records that lacked ideas he was David really loved music um, and he loved musicianship and he loved ideas and he loved the way that music could transform you um, but by uh, with house music it became quite uh, a practice quite early on that a producer or a DJ they might lay down a drum a, a drum track uh, grab a couple of samples and you know a couple of hours later you have a record uh, I know that when I entered the culture I loved these records these tracks yeah they were really exciting the drum tracks were great the samples were really cool and um, and if you mix them it was exciting but I ended up agreeing with David that you know sometimes you need you need these mute these records to do more work David also had this sound system that was very pristine uh, he got rid of his mixer in around uh, in the early 1980s maybe he finally got rid of it I think around 1984 um, his argument was that he wanted the, the the sound system was very important to him and the experience of music and he thought that the more powerful that experience of music there was a reason for this but it wasn't because he was a geek or anything he thought that the more the more accurate the sound system the more emotional would be the experience of the music and that if the music became part of us we could have this transformative experience yeah we could have this beautiful community would emerge through dancing to music so the sound system was very important because it was the music would become more musical and he got rid of his mixer because he felt that the mixer introduced uh, additional electronic stages that would detract from that musical experience. Um, so he stopped mi- being able to mix records. Uh, the way he put it to me was to, was to say, why, if you're going to climb Everest, why would you only go 97% of the way to the top? when you can go to 100%. That was how he saw the sound system. So he got rid of the mixer because he thought that as a result, the, the sound would be even better. So as a result, he couldn't mix records. So when David put on a record, that record had to be good or very good or amazing from beginning to end. And house music, it often wasn't like that. A lot of house tracks were designed because they had one little idea, but the idea was then you would mix to another record with an idea. And David couldn't get on with this music. And he also thought that sometimes it was too rigid, um, too militaristic, um, too um, predictable. Um, You know, David liked the feeling of musicians playing with each other and the unexpected feeling that comes through musicians in a studio jamming. Having said that, David, obviously, he, he, he loved playing new music. And I mean, all of us who are in London would experience this. He would always be asking us to play new music that we were buying because he would want to be contemporary. He never wanted the loft to become a, a museum. Um, so he would play house tracks because there are, of course, house records that have amazing ideas and dynamism. Um, so, but this was so it was a bit of a struggle for David sometimes with house music. But he did he did find music that house music also that he loved. Um, 
Okay. Um, I guess we can we can finish with a, a bit of um, what what you think about the the evolution of the loft philosophy today that he's not here anymore and and w what you think about the the future of these parties in this really digitalized world mm -hmm. where people are less focused uh, maybe um, yeah a bit of all that sure uh, it's a good quite it's a big question <laughs> I'm sorry but, uh, all this is like you know yeah this this stuff you could with all these questions I mean the thing about David, the loft, this culture, you know, clearly at least I, hopefully all of us in the room find it compelling, yeah? And it, there's a certain complexity to it because it's very rich. Uh, it takes, you know, I've, I've spent decades now trying to understand this culture uh, and I've, I get a bit of it, but there's, there's so much more to learn always. Um, what's interesting, what, one of the things that is interesting to me is that um, when, I met, when I met David, everyone was telling me, Don't interview him. He's not relevant. Um, and now we look back, we can see a legacy um, that is becoming better and better understood and is connecting with people, is providing people with a sense of meaning uh, and understanding. Um, I know that when the first book came out, Love Saves the Day, I mean, it told a story of a decade, but the, the beginning and the end and the, the spirit, if you like, the heart of that book was partly around the loft. And I know that when I met David, I felt that, as I said earlier on, that I met someone who was thinking about culture in a, in a way that I connected with, that it was about culture and the world. It was like, how can we make the, the world a better place? And in a way that became very unfashionable at some points because electronic music became um, commercialized. DJs started to ask for fees of 10,000 pounds or 20,000 pounds or 50,000 pounds and remixes could get you know, sim huge sums of money for remixes. And um, the 1990s in particular was booming. The economies were booming. It was on the back of what we sometimes call neoliberalism, the rise of the bank, you know, the, the kind of exponential growth of the banking sector. Um, and it seemed like David was out of sync with the times. Yeah, his values didn't really connect with what everyone else was doing. DJs were into mixing. Uh, it was all about electronic music. It was about worshipping the DJ. When I met David, he said, the way you set up the room, the last thing you do when you walk into that room is you see the turntables, the DJ booth. Why? Because the important thing is that the most important thing about that room is the energy on the dance floor. And the energy on the dance floor will be enhanced if people are dancing together. And the way that the whole sound system is set up, is configured, the way that people eat, From the moment they enter the room, their focus should be on the dance floor, not on the DJ booth. He said, if everyone is facing the DJ booth when you have a party, that means that people are dancing with, every, with someone's back, are dancing with someone's back. And therefore, the energy is not going to be that high. It won't be a very good party. Whereas if people are dancing with each other, then you will have a, you know, the transformation, the transcendence can be good. This wasn't popular in the 1990s. It was the it was the it was the era of the cult of the DJ. Um, but what's interesting, I think, is that I mean, I know that what what I felt when I met David and the sense of meaning and and a kind of if you like almost a sense of a philosophical framework that he gave to me that made sense to me and it was like ah this is why I'm drawn to this culture um, I think it's been shared by many people I know that when people buy this first book that I wrote Love Saves the Day people have a, a have reacted to it in a very emotional way um, many you know people because it's given and this is not i'm just the person who happened to put down the words on the paper all i was doing was communicating a history that was already laid down with david as a particularly important person within this history but it's given people meaning and i in a way i think the longer the more people who found out about this culture the more the movement has kind of spread because there are some very simple principles in there which i think are enduring it's the idea that these parties should be a space where human beings can feel safe they can express themselves, they can make friends, they can feel comfortable, and they can experience the potentiality of what it is to be 
to be human and to be part of, of, of a society and to do this with, with music. How nice that a butterfly has just... Uh, <laughs> um, and these are enduring principles. And we live in a world that is increasingly competitive, individualistic, um, transient, um, where it can be hard if you live in a city to make friends, where it seems that everything is about material value and the clothes that you're wearing rather than more enduring important values. And when people enter into these parties, um, such as, well, I can say Lucky Cloud Sound System as we started it in 2003 in London, people came into that party and they connected to that party. And initially that party was uh, Colleen and myself David, of course, a friend of mine and colleague, Jeremy Gilbert. And then we invited two other people to help us organize the parties. Within a matter of months, or maybe a year or two, we had become a collective of about 50 people who were of people who had come to this party and had connected with the philosophy of the party and had said, I want to become part of this community and I want to work for this community and I don't want to be paid for this because my payment is, is what my soul or my spirit will get from this party. And, and then other people from outside of Lucky Cloud Sound System in London would come to this party and they say, oh, I want to start a party that has similar values. And so now we have parties, you know, all over the United Kingdom, all over Europe. And of course, the loft has kept going in, the, in New York City. And there's this party in Japan. And we can kind of see there's, it's, you know, in a way we are a drop in the ocean. Um, but this drop is, is, is strong and it's vibrant and it's continuing to spread. And it's people who are connecting to these just very simple, values around community and music and dancing. And yeah, so, I mean, we, Beauty and the Bee is this party that's been running in London now for, I think, 12 or 13 years, which is uses the same sound system or a, 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 a has grown out of the sound system of Lucky Cloud. Uh, there's another party started recently called All Our Friends, which I'm involved with, with the Beauty and the Beat guys, um, which has also started. There's a party in Sheffield has got going, which is uh, based on similar principles. Party in Liverpool is going based on similar principles. There's a party in Dublin that's going in the same way. One in Italy. Um, I mean, one in of course in Paris. And now we are in Paris. I mean, it's really there's a there's a sense in which this is this is spreading. And um, you know, the idea is not to take over the world, but the idea is to welcome people into these spaces. And if you enjoy it, then please come back. And if you want to start your own party, then we would love to help you try and get that going and, and, and let you know how we went about doing ours so that we can... Because the idea is to change the world into a, into a better place. You know, there's, there's all... We, you know, I, we got Donald Trump and now we got the kind of nationalists that are taking over in the United Kingdom and the nationalists that got quite, are doing pretty well in France as well, I understand. And, you know, there's this... There's a, there's a discourse of hatred and fear and division uh, that is that is gaining traction in the world in Brazil in India and you know I think you know we it's important to oppose this and to to support culture that proposes a different way of experiencing the world and welcoming people into to that situation. So we exist for the purpose of this party and this culture because we love it, but also because we want people to leave these parties and to spread that message because we want the world to be a more tolerant place, not a, not a nastier place. And this was, I mean, this was very important to David, um, this idea of, of, you know, of changing the world. Um, and, and David's idea was you, the important thing is not to be overambitious. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to start a whole new lecture because we're ending. But you know, the thing with the countercultural movement in the late 1960s is the idea was if, if only the president of the United States and the, the head of the you know, um, Soviet Union, if only they would drop acid, then there would be the end to the nuclear arms race. Yeah, that was the idea. The idea was that we could change the world quickly and easily. And the idea was a great one, but it was what we can now look back and say it was over ambitious. And David came away from that and said, okay, it's not easy to change the world, but I can change what happens in my home. 
And and that will became the principle is you just try and change your immediate environment. And then through the little ripples, like the ripples in a, in a pond or a lip, a ripples in a lake, that's how we can go about ch- uh, trying to change things. So it's one model, but it's, it's a model that uh, is working quite well. So, um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's, it's interesting. There's people are relating to, it. even though David is no longer around. Yeah, the, it feels as though leg, the legacy is becoming more and more influential. Um, so yeah, and we're going to have a nice party to celebrate that tonight. I hope. Thank you, Tim. Thank very, you. Very, very well ending. Thank you. Malheureusement, on va pas, oh, we, we don't have any time for questions, oh. as you might know. No. I, I, I don't see the musical guests around here, so maybe if everyone has one question, we can answer it. But if not... Oh, uh, I guess we were supposed to finish the installation, I don't know, the setup. Okay. <laughs> so uh, is it... Maybe no one wants and to ask. Is anyone anything. has a question? Oui. I'll I'll try and answer briefly. <laughs> Coming back to David Yeah. Um, I, I I was curious about something. You said that in '97 he was not in okay. good economic shape, no. good mental shape, etc. Yeah. Yeah. And you you built like a cloud. Um, few years later mm. he helped you on that and yeah yeah and absolutely collaborating and that was giving him some let's say a new no it's new a really good it's a really good question and it's i mean there's so much with this culture it's it, it's impossible to say it all in two hours you know like you write books and books about this so david was very committed to only putting on parties in his own home um but in the early 1990s um he lost everything um He made some bad decisions. Um, he got involved maybe um, in consuming certain things that were not good for his psyche. Um, but he also got um, ripped off by a lawyer and he lost his property. He had, uh, he had made a lot of money, I was saying. He had then bought a an old theatre in the East Village, wanting to make that into the permanent home of the loft. But um, it was in the the end of the East Village, Alphabet City, where there was a lot of heroin traffic. Um, The US government had promised to regenerate that area, which is why David had moved there. But then Ronald Reagan got elected uh, at the end of 1980, took office in early 1981 and started to uh, cut all the money that was going to go for regeneration. And David, when he moved there, it was like a war zone and he lost 70% of his crowd overnight. Um, about six or seven years later, he lost that building as well. Um, so he was down and out. Uh, he tried to um, rent and hold parties in the places he was renting for the f- next few years. And this was when I met him. Uh, he was on um, Avenue B. Um, I went to a party. Um, he invited me to a party very soon after we met. Um, and It was, an inc- it was a really interesting party. That night, there were maybe three people on the dance floor. It was not happening, really. S- about six months later, David lost that space as well. And from that point onwards, he went to live in an apartment that was tiny. It, he had Clipshorn speakers. He could only fit one Clipshorn speaker into that place. And this resulted in David having to change his idea of, of partying in, for him, a very fundamental way. Up to that point, uh, he had insisted that he only wanted to put on a party in his own home because that was where he would feel comfortable. And I've mentioned this idea of comfort many several times over. But it became untenable for him to even have a a a couple of friends over into his apartment because it was so small. And so he started to explore this idea, which I did mention a little bit earlier, of um, putting on a party in a public space, which had a comfortable feel, a home-like kind of feel. So at this point, uh, he started to put on uh, events in in the Ukrainian center on Second Avenue. Um, He also traveled to, and he traveled to Japan as well. Uh, he traveled to Japan um, because he, uh, not with the idea that it would be a 
what he wanted to do, but he might make some money that would enable him to um, eventually buy a space um, and r restart the loft properly. Um, but when he went to, when he went to Japan, in fact, he was ripped off. The party was a disaster. I think maybe it didn't even happen. He didn't get paid, but he met someone who he became very good friends with. Um, and it was through that connection that he started to realise, ah, oh, maybe I can start to put on parties with friends in these public spaces. Uh, so to effectively uh, try and recreate the loft outside of the space of, of the loft. Um, so, he had, so he ended up losing everything, but it was almost through losing everything that he entered in, the, the loft went into this next phase where he tried to create a loft outside of his home in New York City. Um, in the Ukrainian centre, uh, that he came to London and we started to put on parties in the light and that he started to go uh, to Japan and put on these regular parties in Precious Hall. And so this was an interesting thing, really, because actually it was this that then enabled uh, this idea to spread, really. It's like the loft didn't have to be in one specific location in New York City, in David's home. It was a set of principles that could be taken around the world, really. Um, but so he, it was through losing everything that he went, he in, almost had to become more outward, he became more outward looking and realised that he could start to connect with all these other communities outside. Uh, yeah, but he had, he had nothing. And even through this whole period, I mean, really right up to the end, David was always the poorest person that I knew. I mean, when I say poorest, I mean economically the poorest. Emotionally, maybe he was the richest, um, but he didn't have any money. Um, and so, yeah, so the idea was then to create these communities uh, in these different spaces. And he'd, sometimes he would go to, you know, he went to, I'm not going to start naming the places because that would be unfair, but he sometimes he would then start to go to, you know, a country, meet some people, try and get a party going there. But if the the communication wasn't quite right, if the affinity wasn't quite right, then David would eventually st stop stop doing that party. And the real places that he returned to again and again were Japan and, and London. Um, um, but since since then, other parties have um, started elsewhere, and I, you know, I think this is a really exciting a really exciting development. Um, yeah, but he didn't have much money; he lost it all. All right, thank you. I'm sorry to be the time no, master, no, but not uh, at all. <laughs> <laughs> again, you right. told me. Thanks, guys. Uh, anyway, thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, so after the talking, we we can listen to you during that night. So sure, yeah. People are still here. Be ready to dance. Yeah, <laughs> let's have a nice party. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Thank you.